Thank you very much for coming, and, and, and good evening. Um, and welcome to this SOAS public lecture, um, I, which is particularly supported, and I'd like to thank both the SOAS Center of African Studies and the SOAS China Institute, who between them have uh, uh, put together and promoted this, this event, and the reception afterwards, to which you're all warmly invited. Um, it gives me enormous and really genuine pleasure to uh, welcome and introduce uh, Professor Peter Nolan from the University of Cambridge, who many of you will know. Peter is the Chonghua Professor of Chinese Development, Emeritus now. He's the founding director of the Cambridge Center for Development Studies. He's also the director of a thing called KELP, the China Executive Leadership Program, which each year uh, brings CEOs and other leaders of major Chinese corporations over to Cambridge for a two, three week program where they are um, uh, given lectures by academics but also by global business leaders and others. Um, Peter has probably some 40 years old, he might not thank me for saying that, of deep experience in researching in and on China and teaching on Chinese and global um, socioeconomic development to the point where the Financial Times wrote of him that he knows more about Chinese firms and their international competition than anyone else on earth, including in China. And to the point where in 2009, I think, he was awarded a, a CBE for his services to the integration of China into the global economy. Very interesting citation there. Um, Peter is a, a regular speaker at the Chinese Development Forum, the China Development Forum, which is run by the Chinese government. Uh, he has an honorary degree from the Copenhagen Business School, and I've saved the best for last. He has a master's and a PhD from SOAS. Okay, there we go. So, Peter will talk to us tonight for about an hour, after which there will be some time for you to put some questions to, to him to discuss before, as I said, we can move upstairs to a reception. I think this topic, this issue of China and the West, this crossroads of civilization is deeply important and, and very interesting in the light of some extraordinary language and rhetoric in the West. A kind of, you can pick up a very, very obvious tone of anxiety. Um, for example, in a recent FT podcast, debating whether, anxiously whether, whether the 21st century would be the China, Chinese century where, after the rather American 20th century. And if you look at a, a Bloomberg article about a week or so ago, the language is extraordinary, talking of Chinese and political corporate Chinese political and corporate leaders who have been scouring the globe, was the words they used, with a seemingly bottomless wallet, um, and saying that the size and the nature of some of China's investments in Europe have raised a red flag amongst EU leaders, that China has a London fixation. I mean, who doesn't? <laughs> um, and meanwhile, there was said to be alarm in Germany at the Chinese donation of a five and a half meter tall statue of Karl Marx uh, unveiled in Trier last week on the 200th anniversary of Marx's birthday, um, of Marx's birth. Um, and all this at a time when in much of the West people seem to have lost confidence in, in, in Western models of economic management and, and, and politics, not to mention the, the fever pitch of rhetoric around the current US presidents um, uh, sallies in, a, in the beginnings of a threat of a trade war over China's industrial policies. So, very important, big context, and Peter, if I can ask you to come up and, and talk us through some of these issues. Thank you very much. I was um, scrabbling around 
prepare uh, for this lecture, uh, I came across the following, which was uh, a lecture, the last lecture I gave here was in 2010, <laughs> which was China's Globalization Challenge. So uh, that was 2010, uh, and the world has moved on a little bit uh, since then. So it's um, quite a long time, but very interesting uh, to come back uh, to the institution that I spent uh, five years at in the, the early 1970s, quite uh, memorable to think of what's happened uh, since then um, in the world. Um, and also very interesting to come back to SARS because it makes you think about the extraordinary changes that have happened in higher education in the West. And uh, we're at a crossroads for all sorts of issues, but I think also a crossroads in the nature of higher education. Uh, happy to talk about that in the discussion if people want, but that's not the main topic of my, of my presentation. So as Chris mentioned, um, uh, this presentation takes place at an important time. And when we uh, try and think about the context of these recent uh, interactions between China and the United States and China and Europe, and of course behind, behind all that, China uh, and, and Japan, um, it is helpful to try and situate that in a wider context of the issues that the, the whole global political economy faces. And I think it's reasonable to say that we really are at a, at a crossroads in, in human civilization. If we want to analyze this, uh, I think that um, the most important uh, framework for analysis, the people who uh, give the closest, the best guide to thinking about this, curiously enough, novelists, uh, I think, help a lot. I don't think many of present-day novelists help very much. Um, but I think if we go back to the middle of the 19th century, to Dickens and the detail of two cities, uh, it is extraordinary uh, to think about the opening words of the tale of two cities, which everybody knows, the best of times, the worst of times, etc., etc. And it's, it's so striking that in the course of the last 15 or 10 or 15 years or so, more and more people have started to use this as a frame of reference for thinking about the challenges. It is the best of times, but it's also the worst of times. Uh, the internet, the media is wonderful but terrible, and so many things about the world around us are, are deeply contradictory. Um, we need to remember the positive things, but also think about the negative things, and it is just quite brilliant that Dickens started The Tale of Two Cities uh, in this fashion. The other framework, I think, for helping to think about this um, is the person, the gentleman who's, who's it should be noted diminished statue uh, at the insistence of the local people. It was reduced by, I think, a meter or two in height, which is uh, very happy to hear that. So it's not such a big statue. Um, but that person, his way of thinking, uh, I think is extremely important in terms of the dialectical method of both being able to understand simultaneously positive things about the world in which we live, but also sharply uh, penetrating about the negative aspects of the world around us, and that applies today absolutely as much as in the 1840s, 1850s, uh, 1848, of course, when the Communist Manifesto was written. The other person whose framework is, is quite special, uh, but massively misunderstood, uh, is, is Adam Smith. And one of the themes that I'll probably get to in the course of my talk is the way in which um, uh, Smith's thinking, Adam Smith's thinking, has been absorbed into the lexicon, into the way of thinking about the world of the Chinese leadership in a quite a remarkable fashion. Um, and of course, as anybody who is seriously familiar with political economy and the history of economic thought knows, to caricature it, uh, Smith wrote the two books. Of course, that's a grotesque caricature. But if you like, The Wealth of Nations was about the positive contributions of the market and of capitalism uh, to human progress. But of course, to caricature, the theory of moral sentiments is very different. It's about all the problematic aspects of capitalism. Uh, indeed, in that, he talked about the pursuit of money, the pursuit of profit, which is the driving force of progress, as a deception. This is a deception for us because uh, it is bad for, in so many ways for social relationships and also bad for the people who allow themselves to be focused simply on profit, greed and display uh, 
and that's Adam Smith, not Karl Marx. And in fact, in many ways, I think Smith's writing is, is calmer and more interesting and sharper in, in some ways than Karl Marx, probably reflecting the fact that he, he had to teach. Marx wasn't, above all, a teacher. He was a uh, writer and, and argued all the time in political meetings, whereas Smith had to teach, and I think teaching is quite helpful. So the framework in which we live is one that's deeply contradictory. We have extraordinary, powerful benefits from the development of capitalism, oligopolistic competition between, mainly between large firms, the firms such as those that are at the core, like Qualcomm, uh, like Google, Android, uh, Google that are at the centre of the dispute between China and the United States of America. But these firms uh, have been fantastically progressive in transforming the nature of goods and services around us in ways which are extraordinarily positive for human welfare. And indeed, in producing a cosmopolitan culture, because behind the ideas of, uh, of Marx and of Smith and of so many people thinking about economics in the late 18th and 19th century was the optimistic vision of one world with a common culture that worked together for the common good. And that, in some ways, has happened in this era quite remarkably. But also, as we know, it is the best of times, it is the worst of times. And anybody who is remotely expert in matters concerning ecology, um, knows we live in an extraordinary destructive time in terms of our relationship with the natural world. Um, as one person uh, has called it, has talked about, uh, we face uh, the prospects of an age of loneliness uh, where the species are so diminished uh, that we will live in a world where basically the same species exist across every part of the world and the richness of diversity of ecological life will be even more profoundly eroded um, than it is at the moment. Global warming is so obviously a fundamental problem. Endless debates about inequality. My own favorite uh, statistics on inequality are the inequality of wealth. If you read Credit Suisse First Boston's report on global wealth inequality, as many of you know, simply astounding dimensions of wealth, uh, which we won't need to go into the data. But after 30 years of globalization, this is quite astounding. Uh, and, of course, we have an incredible concentration of global business power. Uh, how to regulate this uh, when companies are global, international, they have no fixed roots uh, in the companies from which they sprang. So regulation of this incredible business power is a huge question. And uh, perhaps most importantly from an economic point of view is the, the risks that are faced in the global financial system. Particularly, I think the risks in the West are much greater than in China. I think the Chinese risks have been exaggerated, though they certainly exist. But I think we face the possibility uh, of a, a major a financial, massive financial disruption in the West, but without the government capability to step in in the rather problematic ways it did, because the government debt is now so high. This is a very, very dangerous scenario. And finally, of course, nationalism. I mean, Marx thought and Smith thought that international trade, development of international ideas would erode nationalism. Uh, well, that's not the case. And the conflict is uh, between countries, people who own passports in one country or another. And the current conflict that Chris referred to is between the United States of America, which is a country, and China, which is a country. So countries remain far, far more important than anybody could have imagined in the 19th century. So how to deal with this? And so the theme of what I want to talk about, which will obviously be extremely schematic, is the role that China can play in this process. To what degree, how uh, might China help to contribute uh, to regulating this global capitalist system to benefit from the things that are useful and beneficial from capitalism, but also to help it to serve through regulation the interests of the mass of the human population. For five 50, 100, 200, 1,000 years hence. What role will China play? Because it, it will. What will its role be? How do we understand it in the West? And that's the central theme of what I want to talk about. Associated with that is the institution called Communist Party of China. Um, in the West, uh, many people, including 
many scholars of China, I won't name, name them, it's, it would be pointless because there is a pretty wide consensus amongst scholars of China in the West. But the Chinese Communist Party uh, faces grave difficulties. Uh, some of the most outspoken scholars have argued that the Chinese Communist Party is in terminal decline. Uh, and behind these perspectives of China, behind these propositions, lies an underlying sense that because the Communist Party of China, which was established in 1921, followed the establishment of communism in the Soviet Union, and many of its features it in, are similar to those of the Communist Party in the Soviet Union, it really is the same animal. But I think this is a grave misperception, and what I've, I want to talk about in the brief space of time that I have is about uh, the ancient roots of the Communist Party of China. And we can see this more and more and more clearly since the death of Chairman Mao. And we can see more and more clearly that the 20 years from 1956 to 1976 were, uh, uh, despite important linkages with the past, which we can discuss, nevertheless, it was an aberration in Chinese history, a period where the market, to use the words of people fighting in that struggle is like a capitalism, capitalism like a dog in the water, to be beaten and, with a stick and drowned. That's very, very unusual in China's history. This was a very brief period, strange period of 20 years in China's history. But we can see more and more clearly, to use the phrase that Chinese policymakers have used, that touching stones, groping for stones to cross the river, more and more clearly than the mist has cleared. And we can see that the other bank of the river, if you like, Bi'an, is a world that is deeply connected, has deep roots in China's history, and uh, not a great deal of connection with the ideology and philosophy of the Communist Party of the Soviet Union. So those are the two themes of what I want to talk about. And uh, because time is very short, I want to leave time for questions, I will present a caricature of, of the historical issues related to understanding China, to understanding ourselves in the West. Uh, because I think to think about these questions in the way in which Senator Fulbright, in his extraordinary book, The Arrogance of Power, talked about international relations. And he observed and argued in the middle of the, the Vietnam War he became very unpopular for various reasons, not simply those connected with the war. And he argued that one of the things that we pay far too little attention to in international relations is psychology. Uh, and I think in order to understand China's history, we underst understand deep questions about social psychology of the whole society in China. And we need to look at ourselves and understand who we are in the West today. Trump is not there by chance. Brexit didn't happen by chance. These are reflective of much deeper forces in the West. And as I will turn to at the end of my presentation, I think we face a big social psychoanalytic problem, issue for ourselves in the West, um, which I think we don't understand very well ourselves. But China needs to understand it and needs to work very hard to understand us, just as we need to work to understand them. So I think that way of thinking echoes the powerful observations in Fulbright's book, The Arrogance of Power. So in brief, what I'll do in this, in this talk is to very schematically talk about the long-run history of China and the West, and looking at it in four parts. The first part is an era of convergence, broadly speaking, in the ancient world. And the similarities are, are more than the differences. Of course, there are many differences, but there are some very important, interesting similarities in the evolutionary path of the ancient world up to the end of the Roman Empire. Then, of course, things change for a very long time, and we have the first great divergence from the end of the Roman Empire, let's say through, we can almost date it, really, through to 1800 which is when Bolton and Watt's advanced steam engine patent expired. And the world really turned upside down. But if we'd looked at the world from 1750, just 50 years earlier, it wasn't obvious that would be the case. But that 
1800 was quite a dramatic point. So that very long period of the divergent paths of China and the West, I think we need to understand both China and also ourselves and the patterns of thought that emerge for us in the West, those of us particularly who are Europeans and Americans and Japanese, but particularly in Europe and then, of course, into North America, what our cultural heritage is. And uh, we don't reflect on it, I think, sufficiently often. And equally, what was the evolutionary path of China? What was the nature of its cultural heritage from that very long period of the first divergence? The second period, third period, the second divergence, let's say from 1800 through until the late 1970s, early 1980s, uh, is of course the world was turned upside down, to use Christopher Hill's, he wasn't writing about this, but the world did turn upside down in, in a fashion that was astounding uh, to Chinese people, Chinese bureaucratic, Chinese officials. And uh, in many ways that continued until even the death of Chairman Mao, in 1976. This was still a period of great divergence and only after Chairman Mao died did people reflect on the huge complexity and difficulties of issues that the Chinese leadership and people faced in the late 70s, early 1980s. Uh, but of course in the West we continued our path of progress and by the time Chairman Mao died in 1976, the gap was enormous between China and the West in all sorts of ways, which I'll touch upon very briefly. And then finally, we come to the, the second period of convergence. And many people have started to talk about an era of convergence, but I would put that in, in a question mark, because there are many aspects of, of convergence but also uh, persistent aspects, not of, of convergence, but of difficulties that are already emerging in the relationship between China and the West. And how this works out, we don't know. So that's the four periods of history that I'll touch upon uh, very briefly uh, in the course of the time available. So firstly, to say a little bit about this period of, very long period of the ancient convergence. And there were many striking similarities in the era before national unity was established in China and before this extraordinary but actually relatively brief period in terms of the, the high point of unity, unity in Europe around the Mediterranean under the Roman Empire, really quite a brief period of, of unity of the whole area through from the Middle East, North Africa, and then through, of course, in, eventually into, into Britain. And so these two great culture areas, before the establishment of unity, each went through tremendous uh, conflict, through tremendous economic change with the development in China, second, third, fourth, fifth century BC and back beyond that. And of course in the, inter, in the Eastern Mediterranean and under the Greek uh, uh, culture. A tremendous evolution of financial system, of commerce, of trade, and alongside that progress of a commercial, if you like, a capitalist economy, we can debate the meaning of that word and whether it's appropriate, but in many ways it is, this prompted both in the East and the West the great thinkers at almost identical time to think about fundamental questions about culture, about behavior, about ethics, about, about good government. And of course we know in the East the most powerful thoughts about how to think about this complex world, particularly of trade, of commerce, of greed, uh, of money seeking, is of course uh, most famously uh, in Confucius, but also of course in, in many other scholars, but particularly of course in Confucius. But the core ideas in Confucius are in a sense very clear, which is that rulers should consider the common interest, it, use the Chinese Tian Xiao Wei Gong, of everybody under heaven. And of course, it's a very famous space, which is susceptible to many different interpretations. But the idea that the rulers should serve the common interest was deeply built into the thinking of ancient Chinese scholars and government officials. The second core concept in Confucius is the concept of benevolence, Zhen, which is more vital, in Confucius's word, to the common people even than fire and water. And when Professor D.C. Lau, who was 
those of you who are not China scholars, um, those of you who are not as old as me, uh, I remember Professor Lau, who was in SOAS in the early 70s, uh, and he wrote the wonderful introductions to the English language translations, his of Lao Tzu, of Confucius and Mencius, and they are really repay, very, very careful reading. He was a great scholar, went to Hong Kong in the end. And he said, this is the most important principle, if you want to understand the Chinese bureaucracy, is the welfare of the common people motivated by benevolence, more vital to the common people than fire and water. And of course, alongside that went a, a sense that government officials should sacrifice themselves. They should work for the people. And of course, there's the famous example of the great builder of water conservancy facilities, the great Yu, who was mentioned by name uh, in Confucius. And he sacrificed his life in building infrastructure for, uh, and lived, as Confucius said, in low dwellings, devoting his energy to the building of irrigation canals. But of course, there is finally a warning of the danger of corruption, which is a huge theme, of course, for China today. And as Confucius said, those in authority have lost the way and the common people have for long been rootless. We must be very careful of those in authority losing track of these core principles. And then, of course, in China, we have this great period of unity, extraordinary unity established under the Qin and then developed under the Han Dynasty, where the emergence of a professional bureaucracy first took shape. Meritocratic bureaucracy, tried through examinations, and the system evolved during the Han Dynasty and evolved further after that. And under this economic integration, the market economy prospered and China achieved extraordinary innovation in all sorts of ways, which I will not detail. Simply to point out that by 220 or thereabouts AD, China's level of technology was far advanced even than that of the Roman Empire, achieved by a bureaucracy that did things that were necessary for prosperity of the economy and society, ruled by the beginnings of a professional meritocratic, meritocratic bureaucracy. In the West, we had this parallel era of investigation of all the similar kinds of things by equally famous philosophers, Aristotle, of course, Plato, Socrates, and others. But they're Preoccupations were very similar. Aristotle was preoccupied with the problems of money, the problems of greed, the problems of usury, and what this did to damage a good society, prevent a good society from uh, stabilizing itself. And he uses the, the term benevolence. Benevolence, remarkably paralleling that in Confucius, is the core of Aristotle's ideal society. And duty to the community comes first beyond individual self-interest. And in a sense, even more remarkably, of course, Plato uh, develops this um, uh, idea speculating on what it might be like to have a society that was ruled by the guardians, people who worked selflessly and in an egalitarian fashion without property for the common interest of the people. And so China developed similar ideas, and they're still there and have persisted over the course of more than 2,000 years as the core standard against which Chinese officials have been judged. But of course, for reasons I'll come to in a second, they faded from the picture in Europe and remained in the background, and indeed were preserved really uh, intact for a long time under Islam. Uh, but they didn't occupy the center of the stage in the way that they did uh, in China. Then, of course, we get this extraordinary era of great unity of the Roman Empire. And just as in China, when the great unity under the Han Dynasty stimulated commerce, capitalism, and the market economy and technical progress, so the Roman Empire, as Gibbon talks about in uh, his uh, masterpiece on the decline and fall of the Roman Empire, for a couple of hundred years, this was an extraordinary progressive economy and society. It didn't achieve the technical progress that China achieved, probably due to the dominance of slavery, but it made tremendous economic progress, tremendous progress in welfare, demonstrating the power of the market to operate in a great unified economy, stretching from the Middle East through North Africa through in, ultimately in, into Northern Europe, into this country. So there are remarkable parallels in this ancient era. And in the case of China, they've remained deeply embedded throughout the subsequent era in its culture, its ideology, and its political system, and the nature of the functioning of its economy most of the time. But then we get this extraordinarily important 
era for understanding China and ourselves, which is a very long era of what we might call the first divergence. And of course, the Han Dynasty collapsed, but it was re-established. And under the Tang and subsequent dynasties, the system developed, and the bureaucratic examination system with meritocratic, meritocratic evaluation of officials' performance, both their selection, their promotion, and their performance, and their demotion, becoming more and more sophisticated. And of course, those of you who are scholars of the Chinese system will know how much debate and argument went on with the system about how to evaluate a good official. What is a good official? Uh, and this alone is a topic for enormous uh, research, historical research, and of course there is a great wealth of such activity. But these ideas are reflected in terms of the criteria by which the Chinese officials are judged by some very important and simple uh, phrases which are deep in Chinese thinking. Uh, so one of these, which illustrates the core principles for the bureaucracy and for the duty of a government official, completely different from the case in Europe, is fan zhong yan. And many of you who are Chinese or Chinese origin will know exactly what I'm going to say. Xian tian sha zhi you or you hou tian sha zhi le or le. And that, of course, everybody, you know, you know exactly what I'm talking about. So, you know, you just got to, I mean, I was with a Chinese person yesterday, the day before, and I just simply wrote down Xian, and he said, I know exactly where you're going. So what it means is, the government, this is Fan Zhongye, who was a very famous Song Dynasty government official. And he said, to translate, that the, the first duty of a government official is to bear hardness, to bear suffering. And only when you've done your duty and you've tried to work for ordinary people can you then be the last person to enjoy yourself. It's very, very simple. Everybody in Chinese culture knows it. And that's deeply written into what a government official ought to do. Of course, nobody ever performs perfectly. But that's the standard by which you will be judged. And you can't complain. But if we go forward several hundred years, a book that I, I came across by chance, which is very interesting, in terms of understanding this psychology of Chinese officials, was published uh, in 1694, as our own enlightenment was getting underway. And there's a very uh, wonderful translation of this book, which is Fu Hui Chuan Shu, the complete book of happiness and benevolence, which actually not that many Chinese people know. And this was written by a local government official about how to train government officials, local government officials, how you evaluated and trained them. Fu Hui Chuan Shu, complete book of happiness and benevolence. Even the title says a great deal about the purpose of an official. And in that, the first paragraph, uh, the author Huang Liu Hong, Huang Liu Hong, says the most important principle for a government official, paragraph one of a huge textbook, is the words of Mencius, Bu ren ren zhi xin. If you do not have a commiserating heart, because for Mencius, the heart is the key to benevolence. If you do not have an a benevolent, a commiserating heart that can put yourself in the position of other people, you will not have a commiserating government. Extremely simple. So these principles against which officials would be judged, but of course never fully matched up to, go back to ancient Chinese thought, to Confucius, to Mencius, and others, and they remained in the system right the way through, in fact, until today. So if we read Xi Jinping, uh, if we look at the text of his speech at the 19th Party Congress, these ideas are deeply permeating uh, his writings and the writings of those who have to implement policies of the Chinese bureaucracy. And nobody is under illusions that any government official ever in history perfectly carried out these instructions or obeyed these criteria. But the criteria are very clear, and it's very different from our own system. So under this system, bureaucratic system, China did all sorts of things. The bureaucracy did all sorts of things to serve the interest of the society and the economy in ways that are actually summarized best, curious enough, by Adam Smith and the Wealth of Nations, one of the reasons why it's so appealing to the Chinese leadership. And if we look at volume two of the Wealth of Nations, little noticed by many writers in the West, is a discussion about the functions of the government. And Adam Smith has, and I will praise him and, and summarize his statement. And in that, Smith says, in a little notice, but extremely important passage, 
that the duty of a government, the last, he called it the third and last duty of the government, is to perform those actions, to do those things, provide those services for society, which no individual entrepreneur or group of entrepreneurs are capable of providing. And only then will those things, if then, insofar as they are necessary, produce a prosperous and happy society. And he adds the qualification, extremely important. This duty will be different in the different periods of social and economic development. And it's a brilliantly sharp formulation. And it describes exactly, actually, what the Chinese government did. So the Chinese government did all sorts of things over millennia. Water control was central, but also famine alleviation, famine avoidance, commodity price stabilization, hugely important. I mean, no people have won Nobel Prizes for their views on commodity price stabilization, for their views on famine avoidance, but the Chinese bureaucratic system was doing this for a long, long time before the Nobel Prize was thought about. China had a legal system with it protected this huge internal trade, uh, and there's no way you could have the massive trade that China experienced without people who were trading being able to receive and go to court uh, if they were not paid. So the legal system protected the texture of a trade. Again, we think in the West about our achievements in the Enlightenment, especially in France, with the establishment of a system of encyclopedias. So the encyclopedists in 18th century France produced these extraordinary compendiums of knowledge to spread best practice knowledge throughout the society. But the Chinese government had been supporting the spread and nurturing of best practice knowledge through, of course, paper and printing, uh, supported and nurtured by the government for a very, very long period of time before the encyclopedists appeared in Europe. So under this system, where when it worked well, which is most of the time, uh, bureaucratic rule, judged by the criterion of serving the interests of the mass of the population, nurtured and stimulated, but also regulated the market economy in a way that produced extraordinary, extraordinary results. The European, the Jesuits who went to China after Marco Polo, right the way through into the 18th century, wrote about China in a way that they regarded as fabulous, an extraordinary successful commercial civilization. If you read uh, Father Duhald, the Jesuit priest writing in the 18th century who collected the reports of all the Jesuits in China, missionaries in China, he says the trade, inland trade of just the Liangxi, Changjiang, is far greater than that of the Mediterranean. Uh, and I'm sure that was correct. What is noticed much less is that China had a thriving international trade, which of course was a small proportion of total trade and total output, but very significant. And people forget that down the Chinese coast, from what today we call Shanghai down through to Guangzhou, there are a whole series of vibrant international trading cities, Quanzhou, Fuzhou, Xiamen, Guangzhou, Foshan, and many others, all the way down the coast. If you take a plane journey from Shanghai to Guangzhou, you just look out the window and you can see where these cities were historically. And they traded across the South China Sea into Southeast Asia, and ultimately many of their products, porcelain, silk, ironware, were exported to Europe. I mean, China exported huge amounts of ironware, for example, from Foshan in Guangdong, which was the city of iron and steel, uh, for hundreds of years, right into Southeast Asia. So there was a big, big international trade, proportionately, of course, not as big as domestic trade. And under this system, China made extraordinary technical progress. Again, I won't go through into the details because they're widely written about, particularly, of course, by Joseph Needham and his team in Cambridge. But and many of them are not well known. I'll just pick out two. The first is the Chinese iron industry. So Don Wagner, uh, who, who now lives and works in Denmark, has produced extraordinary accounts. So you can just Google Don, Don Wagner, and he's produced wonderful research on the Chinese iron and steel industry, pointing out the technical progress that was made and the continuous progress in output and production and all kinds of technologies, little iterative changes in technologies. And by the end of the Han Dynasty, China already had the blast furnace, which didn't arrive in Europe until the 14th or 15th century. And Chinese industry was very large. It had huge production centers in Guangdong, in Sichuan, in Shanxi, and other parts of Dabieshan, other parts of the country. And while Don says we can't estimate with any degree of accuracy, total output in China. 
It's very likely that China's output of iron right up until the 18th century was considerably greater than that of Europe's. And there's no question that China's technical progress was precocious, and it kept making technical progress. But of course, China didn't have the Industrial Revolution, which took place in one country, in Britain, at a very particular period in the end of the 18th century. The porcelain industry is another industry which is extremely interesting in terms of understanding China's innovation and technical progress. And we tend to think of porcelain as being fabulous pieces of pottery in the British Museum or in the Percival David Institute. Or, well, no longer, sorry. <laughs> what was the Percival David? That's another story. What was the Percival David Institute? Uh, and uh, these are wonderful, wonderful pieces. Uh, but of course, um, uh, that was a tiny fraction of the Chinese porcelain industry. A large amount of porcelain was produced for the middle class, the kind of things that probably wouldn't have been in the Percival David. But there was a very big industry, not run by the government, run by entrepreneurs. Uh, and of course, a much bigger industry, producing ordinary, everyday porcelain for ordinary people, simple porcelain. And you can see right the way through into the 19th century, innovation, technical progress, reducing costs, improving glazes, all kinds of things that were science, that were trying to improve things in a way that reduced costs and provided things that people wanted to consume. And it's actually been very little studied, but it's beginning to be studied rather better. A single, we all know about you know, famous cities like Jingdezhen, but a single province like Fujian had 80 or 90 uh, local potteries, 80 or 90 local places where pottery was made in quite substantial amounts. So this is just two examples, and I could go on with many other examples. So this was a virtuous interaction of the state and the market. If you want to put it in Adam Smith's terms, the invisible hand of market competition in all these areas, plus the visible hand of state regulation to do things that the markets couldn't do and to regulate the market in an ethical fashion. But Europe, of course, in this period, well, after the collapse of the Roman Empire, um, we never had. Um, we, we live in Brexit. <laughs> this is still with us. We still live in an extraordinary... Uh, tumultuous, divided uh, society in all sorts of ways. We, you know, drink cappuccino or you know, whatever it might be, but it still is, a, is we're not one culture. Uh, and uh, that division was even more violent and, uh, and deep compared to today, but not perhaps to our more recent history. And so we got to the establishment in Europe in this early chaotic era of the zero-sum philosophy that really, in many ways, is with us right the way through to the present day. And if we want to think about writers who, in the West, try to encapsulate this, Dante is probably the best, uh, writing now quite er late in this era, uh, late 13th, 30, 14th century. And uh, not just in the Divine Comedy, but I think particularly in his book on monarchy. Um, which is an astounding book. And in it, he writes with fantastic passion about what he regards as a horrible society around him uh, in the 14th, late 14th, and late 13th, early 14th century, uh, and um, lamenting the destruction of the great unity of the Roman Empire. But that's a long way in the past. And he writes with great passion. He said, if only we were unified, of course, he hopes unity will be through religion. Uh, what a, how much better it would be than this horrible, greedy, violent, divided society and polity that I observe, as he said, in the monarchy, probably written in the early 14th century. And of course, it's there in even more poetic form in the divine comedy. And of course, we then get this extraordinary phenomenon, which is Christianity um, emerging in this era to which there's really no counterpart in China, but which is very very puzzling uh, to Chinese people, and we could have a long discussion about why and the meaning of Christianity in Europe. This was a period when, for a very long period of time, the rulers were basically illiterate, where the values were military values, uh, and um, this is a completely different uh, political economy context uh, over a very long period of time uh, from that uh, in China. And then, of course, something else happens, which is, in Europe, through absorption from China, Europe developed technologies that in China never had the same impact as they had in Europe, which are military technologies, which of course really started to, to progress very fast in 16th, 17th and 18th century. And then we get the next phase of intra-European relationships, which is this astounding age 
of violence in the age of absolutism. So we can look at beautiful buildings in Vienna or in Copenhagen or wherever it might be. But it was an era of intense rivalry, zero from conflict. But now, not with, not with, if you read John Keegan's The Face of Battle and you compare Agincourt with Waterloo, what a difference. You know, instead of hitting people with a club, we had these incredible instruments of extreme violence produced in Europe, uh, to which there is no, uh, no counterpart anywhere else in the world. And of course, they also permitted our conquest of other parts of the world. And these, of course, were then written about by Edward Gibbon in the 18th century. His, the great work of enlightenment, the decline and fall of the Roman Empire, was a lament for a lost world of Europe, of the ancient world, particularly the age of Augustus uh, in, uh, at the, in, in this sort of peak of civilization under the Roman Empire. But he wasn't writing saying, what a great society we have in Europe. He was saying, it's a very fractured and uh, in many ways deeply unsatisfactory society writing in um, the 1770s, 1780s and the decline and fall of the Roman Empire. So, that's the very different political context in Europe. But of course, so by, let's say, 11th or 13th, 12th or 13th century, there was a huge technological gap between Europe and China. But gradually, gradually, Europe started to absorb technologies from China and build on those technologies. And in a wide variety of spheres, these innovations, which to a considerable degree, came from China, were incorporated into the European economic system. And by, let's say, 1700, 1750, probably European technology was pretty much on a par with China, but it was a very, very long period of catch-up. And then, of course, comes this astonishing turning point at the end of the 18th century in Britain. Not in Italy, not in Germany, not in France, but in Britain. And Britain had the Industrial Revolution, the steam engine, from 1800, so it's a huge question. China had all the basic prerequisites for the steam engine. Joseph Needham gave a famous talk to the New Common Society in Dartmouth on the, uh, the prenatal origins of the steam engine. And he identifies uh, the key elements of the steam engine, the reciprocating steam engine, as the double acting piston bellows and the interconversion of rotary circular to horizontal rectilinear motion. And of course, China had these for a long time uh, before Europe did. And in Needham's view, he thinks that these key elements passed uh, along the Silk Road and of course were evolved and developed and perfected within Europe. But many of the key aspects of what was the key instrument of the British Industrial Revolution were technologically perfectly available uh, in China. So the massive historical question is why in this extraordinary period, this happened in Britain, uh, but not in other parts of Europe, or indeed not in China. And we can happily discuss that. But what I emphasize, this is a very long period, and European catch-up technologically was very late in the day. And many of the habits of politics and thinking about international relations evolved in our psychology, essentially as a zero-sum uh, fashion emerging out of the chaos and conflict in medieval Europe. I will very briefly, very, very briefly summarize so we can finish and have time for some questions. The second divergence and then spend a bit more time on, uh, at the end on uh, the second convergence. So the second divergence, in a sense, everybody knows, so there's not too much point in going through the story in great detail, which is we know, uh, everybody knows, who has the remotest understanding of China, uh, that something profound happened to China, partially for internal reasons, partially for external reasons we can debate in discussion, the proportionate contribution to China's drama of the late 19th, early 20th century. But it was a drama, and it was a profound psychosocial shock for the Chinese intellectual class, for the bureaucracy in the late 19th, early 20th century. We can see this uh, vividly in the May 4th movement after 1911. So this was a drama for the Chinese people, for their leaders, for the bureaucracy. Uh, and it's uh, deeply written into uh, the Chinese uh, culture. And even more, in some ways, puzzling for Chinese people is that even though the Communist Party seized power in 1949, the way in which the Communist Party, Gongshan Dan, Common 
Property Party, which was a fatal, fateful decision to call the party the Common Property Party, Gong Chan Dang. It didn't have to be that. It could have been some other term. But in 1921, this fateful decision to translate the term communist and communism as common propertyism, common property, which is still with the Communist Party today, is a huge legacy, great importance, and nobody at the time realised how important it was, philosophically speaking. So in this extraordinary period from mid-50s, from 1956 to 1976, China attempted to do something which had never happened before, which is to abolish the market, to, as we said, capitalism, treated like a dog in the water, to be beaten and to drown. But this was a very unusual, and increasingly, as people, as we move away from it, we can see that this 20 years was an aberration, a very, very unusual, uh, unknown approach uh, in China's history. Uh, and at the end of that period, um, we won't go into the stories about the struggles and who argued for what, but by the time Chen Mao died, uh, China had huge levels of poverty, as everybody knows. We won't bother to go into the statistics, but shocking dimensions of poverty. And from being an economy that may have produced about a third of global GDP, China produced less than 3% of global GDP in 1980. An astounding transformation of the world compared to the 18th century, ruled by the Communist Party, had not allowed China to catch up. And so China had a, a double psychological, uh, if you like, psychosocial challenge uh, to deal with, which is the long period of humiliation, and then the humiliation and drama of the failure of its economy under a non-market economy to catch up in significant ways with the West and to transform the well-being of the people. In the West, as we know, after the first industrial revolution based on the steam engine, we had a second industrial revolution, if you like, a third industrial revolution going through into the post-war period right the way through into the 1970s. And during this period, the West used its military technologies to establish a second era of colonial imperialism which people in SOAS are extremely familiar with. But behind that was military technology, which, of course, advanced extraordinarily in the late 19th century into the 20th century, which was the material basis for our expanding our empires. British, of course, in the forefront, in France, we don't need to go into that in, in SOAS. But military technologies and their progress were central. And then, of course, for China, uh, and this, of course, was very puzzling uh, for China to observe, because in the late 19th century, we became democratic. The mass of the population, apart from women, of course, until after 1918, but the mass of males, adult males, voted by the end of the century. And our parliaments in the West voted to conquer everybody else. Quite happy if you read you know, Joseph Chamberlain on imperialism, was applauded to the skies for using our weaponry and our technology to conquer, and of course to help other countries. But, but conquest was a reality of this extraordinary period, now voted upon by our democratic system and applauded by our representatives in Parliament. But even more amazing to observe uh, from China and other parts of the world, not just from China, was that in 1914, uh, the democratic governments of Europe voted to slaughter each other. That really was an extraordinary uh, thing in the history of the world, zero sum reaching an extraordinary apogee of violence. And of course, having done it in 1914, we did it again in 1939 to 1945. And of course, at the end of that, uh, we dropped atomic bombs on Hiroshima and Nagasaki um, and many other aspects of this that we could talk about. So this era of Western dominance militarily, economically, right up to the late 1980s, and of course of international institutions, the Bretton Woods institutions were dominated by the West. Then finally, we come to this era that we live in now and all the challenges that it presents for us. The Chinese story is reasonably well known, uh, and um, China has, if we want to capture it in a, a sort of simple caricature fashion, we can say that China has gradually opened up, liberalized and reformed its economy, gradually allowed the market to have a greater and greater role. And so when China today argues that it is predominantly a market economy, um, there's a lot of merit in that argument. China's non-state sector uh, is far more important in terms of its contribution to GDP than the state sector. And the market has indeed gradually, gradually expanded. Uh, and the market forces do indeed, in many ways, occupy a central position in the Chinese economy today. But, as historically in China, 
The state still plays a very important role. Uh, State-owned enterprises are a minor share of the economy, but very important in terms of China's industrial policy. And this, of course, is a key question in the arguments between the United States and China and between Europe and China. So key parts of the economy, particularly the financial sector, but also oil and gas, electricity, transport, mining, metals, telecoms, the media are all very difficult for international companies to operate in. And it's well known. This is explicit industrial policy to try to build national champions in selected areas of the economy. Extremely important is infrastructure, just as it has been historically in China. So if we look at China's record since the 1980s of building health institutions, education, roads, railways, airports, water supply, sewage, electricity, all of which are vital for people's welfare, they played a central role, a much more important role in China than in most developing countries. The most obvious comparator, obviously, is with India. And if we look at the way in which these have been reflected in human welfare, it's hard impossible uh, to dispute that in fundamental aspects of human welfare, in terms of people's longevity, in terms of life expectancy, in terms of basic indicators of education and human well-being, China has made tremendous progress in this era, and China's state action and infrastructure have been a very important part, as they were historically, of the approach, the philosophy of ruling the country in this reform period. The development challenges that China faces, everybody knows, including the end of rural surplus labor, moving out of the Lewis phase of development, uh, huge pollution, which is being dealt with, but is still enormous, and also the challenge on the international front that despite China's progress, its GDP arguably is second largest in the world, global firms still occupy a central role in the Chinese economy. Just take one example, or two examples. If we take um, the telecommunications and banking system. China has far more advanced online financial activities than we do in the West. And most of it is done through mobile devices. And so there are Chinese corporate entities that have a, an oligopoly uh, in, um, in online banking, the instruments through which online banking and e-commerce take place. And we all know the names of these powerful institutions. But if you think about the mobile devices and the conflict with the United States of America, not with Europe, because Europe is so weak in this area. The mobile devices may be made in China, <coughs> but inside them is Western, particularly American technology, uh, Qualcomm, Google, Android, and of course, many of them, Apple technology. So even though China looks as though it's very powerful, it in fact has a long, long way to go to catch up. A second example, which is very vivid, is if you look at some of the tallest buildings in China, such as the 200 story plus buildings in Shanghai, they're produced by Chinese construction companies. But inside those two buildings, 100, 120 stories, are high-speed elevator systems, one of which is Otis, United Technologies, one of which is Mitsubishi Electric. If you look at the air conditioning systems, uh, a carrier, again, part of the United Technologies, supplies the air conditioning system, electricity system by Schneider and by Siemens, the windows, modern uh, energy-efficient windows, Nippon sheet glass, which bought Pilkingdoms of Britain. And if you look at the, the resins around the windows for these giant buildings with a lot of, will, a lot of windows, a lot of high-technology windows, the resin is predominantly supplied by Evenik, a giant global company based in Germany. So what looks like it's Chinese high technology, in fact, inside it, inside it is very powerful Western technology. So China still faces a big challenge in terms of technology uh, catch up with the West. In fact, if we look around us in this country, Chinese firms have a negligible share of our own market in the West and in high income countries. Uh, and as we speak, it is quite clear uh, that China's efforts to try to nurture high technology global firms under the 20 China Innovation in China 2025 has produced a very, very strong uh, negative blowback pushback from the West. So it's a very complicated time. And behind all of this is the, the threat, uh, which we can debate, which has been written about more and more explicitly, particularly by Graham Allison, but he's by no means the only person, uh, which has been talked about explicitly by the Chinese leadership of a, the Thucydides trap of a new Peloponnesian war. And it's simply interesting that so many people have started to talk about it. 
And, of course, uh, the, the possibility of violent military conflict is horrendous, and the possibility is very low. Uh, but so is the possibility, in most people's view, of a financial crisis in the West. And a famous book was talked about black swans. Well, you only need one black swan of military conflict, and that's enough. Uh, so while the prospects, uh, while the possibility of violent conflict, whatever form it might take, is very low, uh, you only need one, uh, and the result will be a disaster. And certainly, both in America and in China, um, the possibility of a new Peloponnesian War, a clash of civilizations, has been quite publicly and explicitly talked about. So the meeting that we were talking about, China Development Forum, uh, Graham Allison was a speaker who's written on the strap from Harvard, uh, now old scholar, but it's interesting that he was invited to come and talk about it. Because in a way, the more you talk about it, the less chance of happening, one hopes. Uh, but again, as Fulbright said, the danger with conflict is that the wars typically begin many years before the fighting starts. The wars start in people's minds. Uh, so mm, it's either a good or a bad sign that so much discussion has taken place about the new Peloponnesian War, but it constitutes a very, very big uh, backdrop to Chinese thinking. Then finally, we come uh, to the West. And it is fatuous to say the West is, is, has been outdistanced by China. It's just farcical. But and the West still has very many, so many powerful features. But I think the least understood is the, the fact that our, our global businesses, those with their headquarters in America and in Europe and in Japan, are still very, very powerful in the global business system. If you look, for example, at the EU's annual report on the top 2,500 companies in the world, by research and development expending. This is the core of global research and development, technical progress. Over 90% of the research and development spending by global firms is from our firms, European, American, and Japanese, and Koreans. If you take the most important sector, which is inside everything, including everything in this room, everything on your person, which is the software control systems. In terms of spending on software by global corporate, by global businesses, in that, uh, the core of American, of global corporate expenditure on research and development, an astounding 77% last year's data is from American companies, particularly in Silicon Valley. And of course, that is the most important item uh, in this uh, conflict, which is what goes inside everything. So we're still very strong, particularly America, much stronger than Europe. So if you, if you like, the West is in no sense uh, eclipsed, uh, and the West, of course, still has very great power in global institutions. Christine Lagarde uh, was not only elected for a first five-year term to be the director, managing director of the IMF, but a second five-year term, which is quite astonishing, really, given the importance of the IMF and the fact that we're all supposed to be one world cooperating together. But finally, we face enormous challenges in the West. I think there's no doubt about it. I think the financial system is still in a very, very dangerous place. And behind that danger is what we can above all, called regulatory capture of the financial system, particularly by US, powerful US banks. And we all know their names. They're very influential, very powerful in all sorts of ways that are not obvious to most people, but very powerful. And if we want to understand the liberalization of the global financial system up until the financial crisis and the way in which the financial crisis was responded to, which is basically to re-stimulate the asset price bubble, we have to think deeply about our own political economy and about the nature of our political system that gives so much voice to a small group of very, very powerful firms, and also our political system, which gives those who are property owners, which is a majority of the population, a very strong interest in maintaining the asset price bubble. And you know, any of you who are fortunate enough to own property will know what this story means. Equally, those of you who don't will know what it means not to have property. But the core of wealth uh, is contained in property. And so in terms of the electoral process, it doesn't matter if it's the green, the blue, or the gray party. They have a very strong interest, whether it's in Germany, or Sweden, or Denmark, or Britain, or in the United States of America, or Australia, or Canada, to ensure that the asset price bubble is stimulated. That's what zero interest rate means. And as a result, we live in a very, very dangerous edge of another financial crisis in the West. And if it does happen, uh, who knows? Who knows? But very difficult to predict.
Go back to 2008. Look at the financial, the Economist's cover in October 2008. It had a picture of somebody standing on the cover of the, of the Economist looking into a dark hole. And the, the title of that uh, issue was Staring into the Abyss. When the financial system goes, I have said prices start to crumble. There's nothing you can do. Catch a falling knife. You can't catch a falling knife. And we forget that at our peril. The financial system, which is the alter ego of the real world of producing goods and services, uh, sits in an extraordinary, uh, complicated and dangerous intermeshing with the world of real goods and services. Um, and one of the most vivid accounts of this is in Adair Turner's book um, on Between Debt and the Devil, uh, who was the regulator. As he said, he got it wrong. He said, I was the regulator of the British financial system. I couldn't see it coming. And he was a very sophisticated economist. And he just said, I didn't know, didn't understand it. So that's where we stand today. We know about the equality of income and wealth, stagnation of real incomes. Everybody knows this story. The uh, nature and conditions of work have changed in unimaginable fashion for people, uh, you know, even for younger people, but for people who are older, astonishing, bewildering changes in the nature of work. And <laughs> if we look at our own country, while our firms are powerful, British, American, German firms are powerful, what are they? So we take this country, our leading firms, and this just, just talk about Britain, is Shell a British company? Is Unilever a British company, which is probably going to move its headquarters to, to Holland? Is HSBC, which came to this country from Hong Kong and is in many ways the world's most successful bank, but it's bought the Midland Bank and it has a, a very weak tradition. Its, foot, its, its roots are in Asia, Hong Kong and Shanghai Banking Corp. Anglo-American, which came from South Africa, and it's, it's a global company which has very little business in this country. Um, BAT, British American Tobacco, which produces you know, a very controversial product. It has its headquarters in London, and it's, it's a British company technically, but it's global. It's global. Um, BP, British Petroleum, Diageo, you can just go, Vodafone. Um, and one of the few companies which has some reasonably deep roots in Britain is Rolls Royce for um, defense reasons. But even Rolls Royce has a very powerful position in the United States of America. So these so called British companies no longer are rooted in Britain. They are truly global. And in terms of big firms, that's about it. You tell me what else there is to think about. Most global firms with their headquarters in Britain are global. They have very little connection with their own political system. So that when the Prime Minister says, come along and talk, say, well, if you want, I'll come and talk to you, but you know, we're global. You know, this, this is just a small part of our life. And then we think of this country, which is the same as other countries. We, we have, you know, the number of famous companies that have gone, uh, GEC, ICI, Pilkington, Rexham, Midland Bank, the list goes on and on and on. So these are now inside other companies from France, Germany, America, and so on. So who we are in the West is bewildering. If I give a talk on these things to a political, I'm not saying you know, to a narrowly political organization and different from today, um, usually at the end of my talk, there's a long silence. And then suddenly, you know, somebody will say, excuse me, is that really what it's like? And I said, yeah, that's what it's like. And me, people are utterly bewildered by it. And you can't, it's not surprising. It's a, it is, this is an incredible, talk about a new era, Xin Shi Dai. This is an incredible new era for us in the West, and most people don't know what's going on. As Bob says, something is happening, and you don't know what it is. Do you, Mr. Jones? <laughs> you know, Bob got everything right, still gets it all right. He's right. And if we look at our position in Europe and this country, um, compare it with China, it's, it's astonishing. The EU in 1980 produced 30% of global GDP. Today, 16.7%. 30% to 16.7%. Britain, 3.8%, now 2.3%. China, 2.3% in 1980, today 17.8%. Significantly above the total EU's share of global GDP. You can debate whether you know, the IMF statistic PPP is right, but the picture, again, as Bob says, you don't need a weatherman to know which way the wind blows. It's very clear however it's blowing. It's very clear. It's very, very clear. And people underneath it, they can taste it. They can understand it. And so, well, they can't understand it, but they can taste it. So this is uh, the age of anxiety uh, in the West. And so, what are the prospects? Firstly, the era of comprehensive Western dominance happened very late in our history. 
basically from 1800 onwards. British Industrial Revolution, the British Industrial Revolution, the British steam engine, not the German or the French, and that was generalized in the West and into America. But this is a very short era, only about 200 years. And the global financial crisis signaled a turning point in world history that maybe was as significant as the end of Bolton and Watts' patent in 1800 on the advanced steam engine. China's tradition of positive sum thinking, of a positive interaction between the state and the market over a very long period of time, in which the period of Chairman Mao is an exception uh, to the pattern of Chinese history. Perhaps, if we try to engage with it, can make, as China hopes and believes, uh, a positive and helpful contribution to the issues I touched upon at the beginning, which is the challenges that we face as a species, how to regulate in all its different aspects this tumultuous global system, preserve, as China's tried to do historically, the power of the visible hand, the benefits of the visible hand to stimulate innovation and technical progress, which was evidenced historically in the blast furnace, evidenced in China's advance in porcelain, evidenced in all these different aspects of Chinese technology which found their way to Europe. And it was a positive, symbiotic relationship between nurturing the market and trying to regulate the market in an ethically driven fashion in the ways that I've talked about, which in a sense Confucius's, but particularly Mencius's ideas perhaps were at least as important in understanding that philosophy of regulation. Pragmatic, regulating the market, but stimulating the market. And perhaps in the West, we can try and learn from that and interact with it positively. So the final theme, final sentences are when we talk about China and the West and the crossroads of civilization, and China talks about a new era, Xin Shi Dan, but it's not just a new era for China. This is a new era for us in the West, and we have to really try to think very deeply about who we are, where we're going, what will our part be, more and more modest part, actually, in regulating the global political economy. And we need to understand China much better uh, in order to be able to work with China, uh, to help to regulate. Of course, endless, just as the ideals of the Chinese bureaucracy were never met in practice. So we'll, understanding is a long and complicated process. It won't just be you know, a deal with, with President Trump. It's a long, complicated process. But especially in universities, we have a very big contribution and duty uh, to help this process of mutual understanding and not to uh, nurture the ideas of conflict. But I think the final observation is that I think China has to also work very, very hard to understand us better, to understand that for us, just as for China, the drama of the late 19th, early 20th century, and even through to Chairman Mao, was a, a huge psychosocial phenomenon, the shock of the advanced of the West, and also the, the, the deep difficulty of dealing with 20 years under Chairman Mao, which produced, a, which, at the end of which, China was an impoverished country which had not caught up with the West. These were huge psychosocial issues for the Chinese intellectual and for ordinary people. But we now face a deep psychosocial challenge in the West, and I think China has to work much harder to understand us. Uh, the final observation is that the 19th Party Congress uh, last November contained a, a very, very long and detailed account of what the Chinese government hoped to do and the challenges it faced. In the Western media, there was no serious reporting of the content. It was simply about the position of the Chinese leadership of President Xi Jinping. I, I didn't read a single serious commentary on the content of his speech at the 19 Party Congress. Now, you can say, that's our fault. Our media didn't do a good job. But you also have to say China didn't do a good job. China should have communicated better. Uh, and so both sides, it's, it, you know, you, it's not a one-way process. So mutual understanding requires both parties to work harder. And China's communication has not worked. I mean, it's, you know, it's just it's seek the truth from the facts. You know, that communication was not very effective. So we didn't understand, we didn't read, but China didn't communicate very well. And that's the context in which we have to work in fact, in, in one of my books, the, the publishers put in the, you know, the Sistine Chapel and the fingers don't touch. Uh, and you've got to make sure that they do touch. 
Now, it sounds trite, but it's not trite because our future is at stake and the future of all the species is at stake. Uh, so uh, it is a crossroads, and our duty in universities is to try to work as hard as we can uh, to understand these sorts of things and try to make sure the fingers touch. Okay? Thank you. Thank you.